although he presented with no breathing difficulty after some time he developed stridor so this is important and it's important to keep all patients with laryngotracheal trauma under observation okay welcome everyone today we'll be talking about laryngotracheal trauma and its management laryngotracheal trauma can be mild requiring only observation and on the other end it can be life threatening requiring a multi disciplinary team to manage this condition so as always we'll start with a case study so here we have a this is a scenario that occurs in most uh, emergency departments it's very common and uh, we have a young patient 28 year old man okay who presents to the emergency department with history of voice change following a road traffic accident and he gives history of a clothes line injury now a clothes line injury is when the rider uh, gets his neck entangled in a wire that's hanging or a, or a or a rope that's hanging okay so that results in a blunt injury in the neck and uh, on examination he has mild contusion over the skin of the neck and he has tenderness on palpation of the thyroid cartilage okay but he what's important is that at presentation he has no breathing difficulty so he was still kept under observation however after a few hours his voice changed worsened he started to develop a little cough and then uh, he started to develop noisy breathing or stridor and when this happened he was immediately started on iv steroids but his symptoms rapidly progressed and an emergency ct neck showed an undisplaced fracture of the thyroid cartilage and an endoscopy was done and there was a hematoma formation with edema of the supraglottis and this edema was causing respiratory obstruction and stridor so an emergency tracheostomy was performed and the fracture of the thyroid cartilage need not uh, was not managed surgically it was managed conservatively and after a few days of medication the edema subsided he was decannulated and he was sent home so you see there was no surgical active intervention for the fracture but and on, although he presented with no breathing difficulty after some time he developed stridor so this is important and it's important to keep all patients with laryngotracheal trauma under observation okay so now let's look at the possible mechanisms of injury so so mechanism of injury can be external okay so what do you mean by external it means the force that it, that injures the larynx comes from outside this can be Uh, a blunt force or a something that penetrates the skin and larynx so you have a blunt injury or you have a penetrating injury okay so you have a blunt injury penetrating now blunt trauma is like the one we just saw in our case discussion so you have clothes line injury you have motor vehicle accidents so motor vehicle accidents are the most common cause of external laryngeal trauma and you have sports injuries hanging homicide uh, or or suicide hanging strangulation all that comes under blunt trauma okay so that is a blunt force injuring the larynx from outside penetrating trauma as you can imagine is something that pierces the skin and then injures the larynx so what is that so obviously that's a knife again in in uh, cut throat injuries in in cut throat of suicide or of homicide so is that all that you have a penetrate with a knife next is a projectile something goes into your uh, neck so what is that usually a sharp a uh, 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 bullet or a sharpener so you have projectiles that is either a bullet or a sharpener okay so So these are the mechanisms of external injury. Okay. Now, what about internal injury? So internal injury is when the injury occurs in the mucosa of the larynx. And how does that happen? So internal injury. What 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 can you think of? How can you injure the larynx from the inside? One, when you have a foreign body, you have a sharp foreign body that's gone. You know, you have a foreign body that you keep trying and removing. So trying and removing, iatrogenic. when you do procedures like endoscopies or intubations or surgeries okay something that you do within the larynx then what else can cause an internal injury when you ingest some kind of caustic substance like in 
like an acid or an alkali they can be a spillover into the larynx or it can touch the larynx and cause injury so a caustic substances then you can have thermal injury how can you have thermal injury when you inhale something hot you inhale smoke or when you ingest something hot so thermal injuries caustic injuries iatrogenic injuries foreign bodies all these cause injury to the larynx from inside out whereas the external is blunt force or a penetrating force that damages the larynx from outside so this is basically the mechanism of injury so next we'll go to the symptoms so what are the symptoms how do patients with laryngeal trauma present so like in our case discussion the most commonest presentation is hoarseness of voice there is a change in voice after the injury and then they may have dysphagia difficulty in swallowing or maybe some pain during swallowing because if there is some mucosal ulceration or burns etc they will be having a dysphagia and dysphagia and pain then uh, if it's an external injury like blunt injury we notice that the patient had tenderness and pain over the neck or over the cricothyroid cartilage so pain is one feature then dyspnea so a patient was initially breathlessness and did not have breathlessness but then later on he had developed breathlessness so dyspnea is one uh, feature and strider noisy breathing strider and dyspnea is one feature and sometimes because of these mucosal ulcerations and lacerations a uh, patient may cough out blood so hemoptysis is another feature so these are the symptoms that the patient presents with now we'll come to the signs so when you examine the patient what are the things that you see so uh, you can see bruises and abrasions over the neck you can see lacerations if it is a penetrating wound you can see lacerations or stab wounds on the skin uh, sometimes if the skin is intact and palpation of the laryngeal framework is painful and uh, sometimes they may be mucosal tears uh, inside the larynx and this will result in escape of air into the subcutaneous tissue and this will result in subcutaneous emphysema which can be palpated in the neck and um, if there is a fracture of the thyroid cartilage there will be flattening of the thyroid prominence or there will be a displacement of the hyoid thyroid and cricoid cartilage so the normal framework of the uh, larynx will be distorted okay and varying degrees of laryngotracheal separation so uh, these are the signs that you see the internal signs will come to later so this is what the external signs that you see and i have uh, had a few pictures here to see see look this is the abrasion and contusions that you can see for blunt trauma this is a penetrating trauma this is a cut throat see is a complete deep laceration on the neck uh, here you can see the flattening of the thyroid prominence okay because of again blunt trauma so varying presentations okay for laryngotracheal trauma now a small mention here in children uh, in children the cartilages are more pliable so a fracture will not usually occur in children and the the cartilage sort of rebounds and comes back to its normal position but in adults because of the the cartilage being a little more rigid and maybe a little calcified especially in older individuals it fractures okay so this is why we lose that prominence or the adams apple gets flattened in fractures of the thyroid cartilage okay so next we have a classification system now generally these patients need to be referred to uh, some uh, expert center and communication of the injury or the degree of injury is very important and that is why they have developed a classification for laryngeal trauma and it's known as the shaffer firmin classification okay and in this classification we group patients from 1 to 5 where 1 is just very minimal injury and five is complete laryngotracheal separation so uh, you need just need to know an overall overview of uh, this um, classification the main thing is in group 1 there are no detectable fractures okay so just minor endolaryngeal injuries just hematoma things like there is no fracture in group 2 it's a slightly more severe there may be a fracture but it is not displaced okay so a non displaced fracture with again hematoma mucosal injuries varying degrees of airway compromise group 3 a little more severe you have exposed cartilage or you have a displaced fracture you have vocal cord immobility you have massive edema and large mucosal ulcerations okay so you have exposed cartilage now you have fracture that is it's placed okay and group 4 is just the same as group 3 only thing a little more severe that is you have more than one fracture comminuted fracture 
uh, disruption of the anterior commissure, all that comes under group 4. And finally, you have group 5 that is complete separation. Larynx and trachea, that means from the cricoid and the trachea, it gets separated. So, complete laryngotracheal separation. So, that's group 5. So, this is the sharper Feldman uh, grading. We'll just take a few examples. Look, so this is uh, a probably a group 1 where you don't see the, the, the framework, it looks normal, it's unlikely to be any fractures here, just a hematoma involving this cord, okay, it is not causing respiratory comprom a compromise, okay. So this is a shaffer ferment one and then look at this, this is a slightly more severe, probably a group 2 or group 3 injury where you can see a large hematoma, okay, involving the uh, arytenoids, eryepiglottic folds, um, and you can see here there is a granulations and hematoma of the vocal cords. The uh, this this area may then later on cause airway compromise. So so this is a slightly more severe injury, probably a grade group three or uh, if there are fractures, group two or group three. Okay, and now look at this. This is like a complete. Uh, mess of the airway. You can't even see the airway here. Probably there's a complete trichotracheal separation here. There's exposed crash cartilage and uh, this is definitely a group 4 or even a group 5. Okay. Now, there's one more classification that you need to know that is Rune and Christensen's classification of neck zones. Okay. Now, why is this important? Now, look at this. Look at this picture. If you have uh, an injury in zone 1, so what's zone 1 from the cricoid below to the sternal notch okay so this area is this area is zone one or if you have an injury from the angle of mandible to the skull base that is zone three now you look at these areas so if you look at this area it's just cricoid to the sternal notch okay so that area is not very accessible these contain very important vessels they are deep uh, even injuries they cannot be seen very easily because of the clavicle and the thorax so any injury in zone 1 will be difficult to diagnose and will also have poor prognosis. And similarly in zone 3, because this part is also not very accessible, the mandible prevents access, you can't see what is injured there, and it's difficult to surgically approach anything over there. So zone 3 and zone 1 have poor prognosis. But zone 2, that is from your angle of mandible to your cricoid. That is the area that you can readily access. This can be seen quite well. And injuries over there can be easily managed. So, zone 1 and 3 have diagnostically and surgically more challenging and more <coughs> difficult. Okay, so that's Rune and Christensen's classification of neck zones. Now, we'll come to the management protocol. I know this is a very busy slide. And um, we'll just break this, this management protocol down. Okay, so... So we'll, now, <clears throat> the, uh, if you have a suspicion of laryngeal trauma, like for example, in our case study, this person comes with change in voice after a motor vehicle accident and he says that he's been strangled by a wire. Now, you don't know whether there's any airway compromise, but at the moment, he was stable. There was no respiratory difficulty. He just had voice change. So those patients who do not have any impending symptom of airway obstruction comes into this category. Okay, that is the airway stable category. And those patients who are impending obstruction, that means it's obvious that the patient has a serious airway problem, they go into the impending airway obstruction category. Okay, so there are two broad classifications. Okay, now in a stable airway, if the facilities are available immediately, it is always better to assess the airway using a flexible nasal endoscope. Okay, so you insert the, no, uh, the endoscope to the nose and you visualize the larynx. It's always better to see the opening of the larynx to see how much uh, injury has occurred. Okay, so flexible nasal endoscopy is warranted even in patients who are asymptomatic and who do not have impending airway. If it's not immediately available, it's always better to keep these patients under observation and before discharge do a flexible endoscopy. Okay, so that is for a stable airway and if it's normal endolarynx, you just manage conservatively, just do repeat the uh, flexible endoscopy at discharge and that should be more than enough. Now, what happens if you have an abnormal endolarynx? Like in our patient where we saw, we saw that initial picture where there was a minimal hematoma. 
So that was a very small hematoma. It was not causing any problem. There was not much of an abnormality. Uh, maybe you want to confirm that there is no fractures. Like in our patient, there was an undisplaced fracture of the thyroid. So that we can do by a CT scan. So if you find an abnormal endolarynx, it is better to do a CT scan. Because what happens? Because the supraglottis, if there is supraglottic edema, you may not be able to pass the endoscope below to see if there is any obstruction. So um, it's always better if you have an injury to the uh, larynx, then you take a, if you have an abnormal endolarynx, you take a CT scan. Now, in CT scan, you find that there is no active airway encroachment. This is probably a stable framework, an undisplaced fracture, uh, nothing below the level of that hematoma. Uh, even then, you can manage conservatively. You just do serial flexible vaso endoscopy and you observe the patient. Okay. So, that is uh, the management for a stable airway. Okay. So, that is one side. Now, what happens? You see the uh, larynx through a flexible endoscopy and you find that, you know, uh, the patient's change in voice is actually caused by a hematoma that could cause a serious problem later on. It looks severe. In those cases, those patients get transfer to the impending airway obstruction category. Now, impending airway obstruction, the management is secure the airway. If you have a penetrating injury that is opened up the trachea, secure the airway through that opening. If you want to make an opening below that, you do a tracheostomy and you open the airway below that and you secure the airway. Endotracheal intubation is generally not advised for um, uh, laryngeal trauma uh, because the the passage of a tube through a damaged or an injured um, larynx will, may cause further damage. Okay, so it's always ideal, if possible, to do a tracheostomy to surgically, uh, um, or if, if the patient comes with an endotracheal tube intubation from outside, then it's better to convert that into a tracheostomy. It's always safe to have a tracheostomy, and then you do a CT scan. Okay, so after you stabilize the airway, you do a CT scan. And the CT scan will show you if the, uh, the, the amount of fractures or amount of um, um, injury that has happened to the framework. Okay. And after that, you can assess the patient under. Once you've secured the airway, once you've got an idea of the uh, uh, laryngeal framework through your CT scans, then you can do an examination under GA, uh, uh, microlaryngo, uh, tracheobronchoscopy. You can you can insert the scope and you can visualize all the endolaryngeal injuries under GA and at the same time you can manage those injuries. Okay, so that is, so, uh, so what, what is the, 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 what is the first priority? It is management of the airway. Okay, so if there is respiratory distress, immediate tracheostomy. If it is a stable airway, then you do a nasal endoscopic evaluation. Okay, then further assess with the CT scan, endotracheal intubation generally avoided and in all cases rule out cervical spine injury. Okay. Now, you decide that uh, you want to manage this patient conservatively. He does not require any active management. So, what are the, how do you manage this conservatively? You admit the patient in a HDU or an ICU for at least 24 hours post trauma and you keep frequently reassess the airway status. You keep serially doing uh, endoscopy or uh, um, you assess the patient's symptoms and you give high flow humidified warmed nasal oxygen which reduces the work of breathing, head and elevation to reduce the edema, high dose steroids to reduce edema, proton pump inhibitors to prevent regurgitation injuries and prophylactic antibiotics. So if there is antibiotics actually are not necessary in all cases. But if there is a mucosal injury, if you feel that you know the, there might be some uh, chance of infection then antibiotics can be started. Okay. Now we'll come to surgical management. So what is the surgical management? Like I said first, tracheostomy is the first surgical management. Now if you have a fracture of the thyroid cartilage or if you have a fracture of the laryngeal framework, you need to reduce that fracture. Okay, so there is an open reduction in wound. You, if there is already a wound, you can go through that wound and explore the neck or you can open up the neck and you reduce the fracture and you stabilize this fracture by mini plates or titanium plates or sutures or you can wire the cartilage. Somehow you bring the cartilage, the fractured cartilage in alignment and you fix it over there. So that is open reduction and fixation. And if there are mucosal injuries, 
So before you reduce this fracture, if you find there are mucosilinger is inside the larynx, you can repair it with the absorbable suture. Okay. And um, if there is a laryngotracheal separation, then you need to uh, debride the edges and do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And whatever procedure that you do, whether it is a fixation, whether it is an end-to-end -end anastomosis, the chances that during healing there will be dandration and fibrosis need to be kept in mind. And in all cases, it's better to do a laryngeal stenting with the silicon tube or various types of laryngeal stents are available. So you can do that. So look at this picture. So you can see here there is a fracture of the uh, thyroid cartilage. And so you open up, reduce this fracture, and you fix it with these titanium plates. These are actually titanium plates like that, okay, mini plates. Or you can even suture the uh, cartilage. Okay. Now, once you've done that, you need to keep this area patent. So, you put in this. This is a silicon stent. Okay. So, this stent is a very um, non-traumatic thing. So, this needs to be kept in for a few weeks uh, uh, until the, um, uh, the the injury heals. Okay. And this tracheostomy is maintained until then. Okay. And this is a laryngotracheal separation where you debride out these edges and you suture and then you put a stent again inside. Okay, so these are various methods that you can correct. Now, management of uh, neck trauma, this is just the larynx. So, there may be injuries to the vessels, there may be injuries to the esophagus, there may be injuries to many other structures. Okay, I mean, no, there may be, the nerves may be cut. So, you need to take it in a systematic approach. Um, first, you secure the airway. Then, you call the uh, vascular surgeons or the people who um, um, correct the um, injuries to the vessels, you secure the, uh, maintain hemostasis and then you go on to repair the esophageal injuries and then you finally um, repair the uh, endolaryngeal injuries and then finally the laryngeal framework and uh, this can be done in a staged procedure also. It may not be done in a single stage. Sometimes you have comminuted fractures where you can't really do or plan an emergency uh, reconstruction. In that case, you just do your tracheostomy and come out let the other surgeons do all the um, you know, repair of the vessels and the surfaces and things like that. And then you plan your uh, reconstruction. Okay. Now what are the complications? Oh, it's quite obvious. You can have injuries to the, the current laryngeal nerve, which will result in vocal cord paralysis. And you can have intractable aspiration if there is loss of sensation of the larynx. If the internal laryngeal nerve is cut somewhere and then there will be loss of sensation and there will be aspiration. Sometimes, even though in the best of management of reconstruction and stenting, patient develops stenosis and fibrosis and the patient is not able to breathe. So, supraglottic, glottic and subglottic stenosis is quite common. And then immediately after the procedure, the patient can have perichondritis or laryngeal abscess. So, all these are complications that need to be managed. Okay. So, with that, we come to the end of laryngotracheal trauma and its management. Okay, now let's take up a few MCQs. Okay, let's recap what we have learned. So, the first MCQ, the most common cause of laryngotracheal trauma. Okay, so now come back to the mechanisms of injury. Okay, so you have iatrogenic, homicide, uh, road traffic accidents. So, in, out of these options, the most common obviously will be road traffic accidents. Okay, so road traffic accidents are by far the most common cause of external laryngeal injury. Okay, so just remember that classification on mechanism of injury and let's see the next question. Most common presenting complaint in blunt injury neck is, so uh, if you remember our uh, case study, so what did the patient present with after road traffic accident which was the commonest cause and what we present with change in voice, okay, so hoarseness of voice or change in voice is the most common complaint. Uh, the other complaints are pain, dysphagia, dyspnea, you know all that. Okay. Now, which zone is considered to have a relatively better prognosis in neck injury? So, what was this classification? Uh, if you remember the name, you don't you need not remember the name, but it's good to remember. So, it's a, what is it? Rune and Christensen's classification of neck zones. And you know that there are only three zones in the neck. Okay. So, you start from below and go upwards. Okay, you start from the low and go up. So, you have zone 1 below the cricoid and the sternal notch. Then from the cricoid to the angle of mandible is zone 2. And zone 3 is up 
that is from the angle of mandible to the base of skull. So that is 1, 2 and 3. So which have better prognosis? So you know that zone 1 and zone 3 have surgically and diagnostically poor prognosis. So you answer is zone 2. Okay, complication of laryngotracheal trauma. Okay, so stenosis, yes, stenosis can be supraglottic stenosis, it can be glottic stenosis, it can be subglottic stenosis. Stenosis is one of the most important complication of laryngotracheal trauma. Vocal paralysis, yes, why? Because you can have a dislocation of the arytenoid cartilage, you can have injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, you can have many other uh, reasons why you could have a vocal cord fixity or vocal cord paralysis. It can be unilateral or bilateral. So, yes. Okay. Perichondritis. Yes. Uh, in, in penetrating dirty wounds or infected wounds, you can have perichondritis where there is extensive stripping of the uh, mucosa uh, of the uh, or pericondrium of the cartilage. So, it can have perichondritis. Yes. So, obviously, the answer is all the above. Uh, what are the other complications? You can have intractable aspiration because of this vocal cord paralysis. You can have loss of sensation of the larynx because of injury to the internal laryngeal nerve. So you can have loss of sensation uh, causing aspiration. And so think about all the complications that we learn. So now this is just a uh, um, um, question on the protocol and management. Uh, following neck injury, the patient presented with hoarseness of voice. Okay, with no stridor. So this was again like in our initial case discussion, patient had only change in voice. He had no stridor at present. Okay, so what would you want to do? So remember that classification, that, that busy slide where we had uh, uh, imp impending airway obstruction on one side and then we had a stable airway. So now is this a stable airway? Yes, it's a stable airway because patient has no stridor. There is only hoarseness of voice. There is no breathing difficulty. So, this is a stable air and you have time. So, what is the first investiga investigation? It is a flexible scoping. Okay, excellent. Now, after flexible scoping, you see that there is some mucosal edema, things like that. So, then what do you do? You do a CT imaging. Okay. You need not do that for all cases. Only if you find that there is some abnormal endolarynx, you do a CT image. Okay. So let's let's just take that. You know, you did the flexible scopy, and uh, both the options with flexible scopy has CT imaging. Okay, so you do CT imaging, and then you find that there is some impending airway obstruction. Okay, so how do you want to surgically, um, you know, secure the airway? You try and avoid the endotracheal intubation, and you go for the tracheostomy. Okay. So, um, this is just a question to recap the protocol. So, just keep all that in mind. Okay. Thank you.